There we go. Got the recording going, got the sharing going. Welcome back, everybody. Happy to have you here with us. We have a quiz to go over, formative assessment, as I call them. So first question, these are reviewing uh, the alternative covariance structures and then the beginning of the current unit that we're in, lecture five. So what kind of pattern of variance and covariance does a compound symmetry model predict? So just the, the overall big picture here, what is the pattern? Not how do you make it, but just what is the pattern? What kind of variance across time? Unchanged. Unchanged, yeah, constant. The same variance across all the occasions, that's what compound symmetry predicts, as well as what kind of pattern of covariance does it predict? Also constant. Also constant, yeah. So in other words, all of the occasions are correlated between persons to the same extent. So if you are above the mean at occasion one, then you're likely to be above the mean at occasion two, and above the mean at occasion three, and above the mean at occasion four. It's a constant relationship. Because what the model says is that the only reason that there is any kind of correlation of occasions is because of mean differences, the idea of a random intercept. And there are two equivalent ways of telling SAS data or R that you want a compound symmetry model. One way is to say that you want an R matrix that has compound symmetry as its type. So that would be an R only structure where you say type equals compound symmetry. In Stata, it's called exchangeable and um, it's comp sim, I think, in R. The other way is to use a random intercept in the G matrix. And so you take a random intercept variance in the G matrix as a random effect, then the R matrix becomes the level one residuals that are left. And you can say that those have a VC or no correlation structure. So both of those are, are equivalent ways of giving the model compound symmetry as a pattern. Uh, how many parameters does it take to form a compound symmetry model for the variance? This will be a finger question. How many parameters are in the model? Two, no matter how many occasions, because it doesn't matter how many occasions, it's equal variance over time, period, equal covariance over time, period. Um, a few of you asked me, well, what about the means model? That wasn't the question. So I'm, refer I'm focusing just on the model for the variance and how many parameters that side of the model takes. So that could be paired with any kind of means model, meaning fixed effects related to time or not. That's a separate set of decisions that achieve a separate purpose. So variance models, model for the variance, how, what kind of pattern of variance and covariance are we predicting? That's what those parameters are supposed to tell us. So any questions on that first question? All right, then how about unstructured? So if I say I have an unstructured model for the variance, given four occasions, how many parameters would I have? Also a finger question, but it will take all of them. <laughs> yeah, it's 10. So there's a formula for it. It's n times n plus one in the numerator and divided by two. It's the number of distinct variances, so one for each occasion, and distinct covariances, one for each pair of occasions. And there are also two ways to generate an unstructured model for the variance. The easiest way is just to tell the program that you want the R matrix to be unstructured, to not use G then all the variances and covariances are estimated directly. There's also a way to do it with a random intercept. The only catch is that you have to shut off one of the covariances in the R matrix to keep the model identified. So that's UN N minus one, as I called it in the book. But the key idea here is that you're not predicting a pattern. You're letting the data take on whatever pattern it is. So it's, it's not a savings in terms of parameters. It's the most complex model you can have and it's only possible for balanced data. So when each person shares the same possible occasions. So it doesn't have to be equal interval, but it has to be balanced. So balanced would be if everybody came at time zero, everybody came back two months later, everybody came back six months later. 
All right, those aren't the same intervals, but if everybody shares the same possible values of time, that's balanced. If some people came back a week later and some people came back two weeks later and some people came back three and a half weeks later, that's unbalanced. And you can't have an unstructured model because you'd need a distinct set of rows and columns for each person. All right. Can you explain yeah. what, the, what the benefit is in having fewer parameters? I mean, we're choosing a model that has the fewest parameters but still has the maximum predictive power. Uh, power is exactly the reason why. Oh, okay. So if you spend more parameters than you need, that can decrease the power of your model because you're trying to estimate more stuff than, you, than is necessary. I see. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that many occasions, if you have, say, two, three, or four occasions, unstructured is probably fine. Where it starts to break down is when you have a lot of occasions and not that many people to estimate them with. So you want to see if you can get away with something that's simpler to preserve your power. And it may not even be possible. So for instance, your next homework assignment, which I saw a few of you, a few of you have started on, an unstructured model isn't even possible because I gave you six occasions and 15 people. So SAS will blow up when you try to ask for it because there's more parameters than persons. So it's not always possible to do unstructured, but when it is, it's not always a great idea because it may be overkill. All right, other questions? Oh, um, I know three of you mentioned the ties to ANOVA in your answers, I think. Maybe more than three, but I did remember seeing that a few times. Um, compound symmetry is otherwise known as what kind of ANOVA? Starts with a U. Univariate, yeah, it's the univariate version of repeated measures ANOVA is a compound symmetry model. And the unstructured model is the multivariate version of repeated measures ANOVA or what is sometimes called MANOVA. So when people use those words, they're probably talking about least squares estimation versions of these models. And if they're talking about least squares, then the other requirement is that you have to have complete data. So we are shortcutting that requirement by using likelihood estimation instead. Um, so the, the ANOVA models become choices. They're sort of the defining endpoints of what you would consider for longitudinal data, compound symmetry being the simplest model you would entertain, and unstructured being the most complex. All right, then question three. A lot of you articulated this very well. It doesn't take a lot of words. Uh, the idea is that one way of creating a pattern is by divide and conquer. So the total overall pattern of variance and covariance across time, one way to do that is to separate out person mean differences. So the deviation of each person's mean from the grand mean, that's the random intercept, and it can be the mean that is predicted by a model, as we'll see once we add fixed effects of time. And that goes into the G matrix. So the variance across persons in the random intercepts is level two random intercept variance goes in G. That means what's left in R is the within person. So the residual variances and covariances are left in R. And so they combine back together again. What's the name of the matrix that has them both combined back together again? This can be a finger question too. V, I'll give you the cheerleader version. V for victory. So if I don't have a G matrix, then R and V are the same thing. So an R only model tries to, to pattern everything in the same place. It's the same as V. Once you invoke a G matrix to distinguish the random intercept variance, then R and G, G put back together again are V. Are there questions on that as an idea? If you don't remember how to make all the patterns and exactly what it is, that's okay. I just want you to have the concept of the way that we approach longitudinal data is to try and distinguish what patterns of variance and covariance are because of between person characteristics and what patterns are because of within person time characteristics. And we put that back together again to come up with an overall prediction. Question, 
No G, R, and V are the same. Yes, R is V if there is no G. Yes, indeed. All right, and then this one, fixed effective time and random effective time. So more generally, a fixed effect is a constant. So the intercepts and slopes that you remember from just regular old regression, those are fixed effects. They apply equally to everybody. So people share them in multiplying predictor variables to create an expected outcome. A random effect is a new thing. Random effects are only possible when each person is observed more than once. So a random intercept is possible once you have two observations per person. A random time slope is possible once you have three. A random time slope is a deviation from the fixed effect of time that creates each person's individual time slope. So more generally, if a random effect of time is in a model, that allows people to differ from each other in how much they change. And we're going to estimate a variance across people in how much they differ from the average change. So fixed is the average change. Random is how far off your slope is from fixed slope. And the model estimates the variance across people in those offnesses. So the idea of a random slope is a deviation. Fixed plus random back together again gets you to your individual slope. All right, questions on any of those? No, we're good? Mostly good? All right, well, let me know if you think of anything. And then what I would like to do as a way of reviewing is to go over what we've been talking about in code show you how to actually make SAS, STATA, and R do your bidding to estimate these models. So I'm picking up with example five, practice with fixed and random effects of time. This is following uh, chapter five in the book. So you can, you, you can also refer to the Piles of Variance website for how to do these models in SPSS. Um, I've added uh, STATA from that website, and then I've added new R code that's not up there, which is unique to this class. So fighting my way through those things. Uh, these are fake data because fake data are very well behaved. Uh, the story is that I've got 25 persons. I've got four occasions, which are equibalanced and equidistant in this example. And we're just looking at the process of how I would go through starting with our baseline models and then considering how those baselines are going to be uh, improved upon or not by adding fixed and random effects of time. So first up, importing data, telling it where your stuff is. That's SAS code for doing so. I am creating one new predictor variable. So time is going to be used as a quantitative predictor variable in the models. It is centered such that the first occasion is the time zero. So wave is going to be a categorical ID variable for which occasion is which. Time is going to be the quantitative version that goes in the model. Now this is a distinction that matters in SAS. As near as I can tell, it does not matter in STATA and in R, but I'm going to use these two variables in the same way for consistency. So wave is an ID variable that tells you which is which. Time is the predictor variable that's going to define fixed and random effects. So I'll do the same thing in STATA, generate a new variable for time. And in R, the same thing takes longer, but that's okay. So we have, uh, let's see, where's time? There it is. The uh, making a new time column within the example five data set from wave minus one. And I also had to create another version of wave in which the four was the reference category to match the output from SAS. So that's just an extra variable I had to create to do that. And I have a caveat. Okay, so people on the internet who watch these videos, this is for you. If anybody can help me figure this shit out, please do not hesitate to email me. Because right now it looks like I have to do two different versions of the same model in R to get all of the output that SAS and STATA and SPSS would give me in one shot. So if you know that I'm doing this wrong and you know a better, faster way, please tell me. 
and by people on the internet, that also includes you guys. So if any of you are better R users than me and you want to help me, please, I will not be offended in the least because this is painful to have to do the same thing twice to get all of the information. So that's my caveat. All right. So in these data, it is possible to estimate what I call the answer key model and the answer key for both sides. So model for the means describes the fixed effects that are needed to describe the average trajectory over time, model for the variance, random effects and residuals needed to fully describe the pattern of variance and covariance across occasions. So it's two different sides, each has its own answer key. So this model, saturated means, that's the answer key for what the trajectory should look like. Saturated means is I'm going to just treat time as a categorical predictor. I'm gonna estimate an intercept for a reference occasion and every other difference for each other occasion using dummy codes. So I'm treating time as a categorical factor variable. And then on the variance side, I'm fitting an unstructured model. So letting each variance and covariance be whatever it wants, that's the best it can be. So this is going to inform what kind of patterns I see that I can then try to predict using fewer parameters. So a saturated means model would look like this. Wave four is my reference occasion because in SAS, the highest category numerically or alphabetically is the reference and it's a pain in the ass to change it. So I've left it that way. So beta zero would become the expected mean for wave four. Each of these predictor variables is a dummy code distinguishing the other wave from the reference. So wave one tells me how different wave one is from wave four. Wave two tells me how different wave two is from wave four. And so these are fixed effects. So I'm using sort of composite notation just to keep this straightforward. I'll show you the multi-level notation once we get into fixed and random effects where that makes a little more sense. And note what is inside the SAS code here. Wave, 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 wave. So most importantly, by putting wave on the class statement, what I'm asking SAS to do is internally create those dummy code variables that distinguish the reference category from each of the other categories. So it is going to see wave and go, oh, how many categories are there in the data? Okay, four, cool. That means I need an intercept and three contrasts. And it does that all under the hood for me. So when I put wave in the model then, I am then asking for three fixed effects that distinguish each other wave from the reference wave four. So treating time as just a categorical predictor. Then because I have wave in the model, and wave being treated as categorical, I can put wave on the LS means. So what LS means does is then recombine the fixed effects as linear combinations of intercept plus the slope for each one to get to what the predicted mean is. So for instance, LS means will do the work for me to figure out how these two fixed effects create the actual mean for wave one. It's what it is at wave four, which is beta zero, plus how far off wave one is, which is beta one, you add those two betas together, you get to what the wave is predicted to be at, at number one. LS means does all of that math for you. Then the repeated, that's my model for the variance. So it's an R only model, everything in one matrix, it's unstructured, it is the best that it's gonna get. So based on this, combination, I'm trying to see what is the pattern of average change? Is it linear? Is it nonlinear? And also, what is the pattern of how the variances and covariances change across occasions? Letting them everything be what it wants is my way of sort of descriptively saying, what should I be modeling? What are the patterns and what approaches are going to be most useful for predicting those patterns? Okay, with me so far. Okay, state of folks, we're doing the same thing, except in stata, the first 
category as the reference, and so I'm switching it to make it last by the IV last so that it matches the SAS output. I am shutting off the default random intercept because I don't want it yet. And residuals unstructured, T wave is how I tell it I want an unstructured matrix with wave as the IV variable. So I think technically it would run without this part and without wave here. The reason to keep it in is because of missing data. So if you have somebody, let's say that they have wave one, two, and four, without wave in the code in those places, it would take their fourth wave and put it where three goes because it's like the third row for that person. So to make sure if you have any missing data that the occasions get put into the right rows and columns, you have to put an ID variable for which occasion is which. So that is the role of wave here and here to make sure that that happens. And then not a default, you have to ask it to use denominator degrees of freedom, otherwise everything becomes a T or a chi-square uh, in terms of the significance tests. And I'm asking it for the predicted R and R core matrix to be shown in a matrix form, that way it looks a bit easier. Contrast is how I get an omnibus F test that shows up by default in SAS, and small makes it use denominator degrees of freedom to turn it into an F rather than a chi-square. Margins gets me the predicted mean for each wave. It's the same thing as LS means. And pairwise differences where you have to tell it what the degrees of freedom are. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, I think this should have diff equals all to match that. Sorry, I took that off of there. So I'll go back and fix the handout that should have that to get the pairwise mean differences if you want those. Okay, uh, any questions on SAS or STATA so far? All right, R folks, this model is using GLS because both LME and LMER insist that you have random effects, whereas GLS does not. So this is the only way that I could find to fit an unstructured uh, R matrix. And so I am using the core sim function. That gets me all possible correlations. And then the weights part allows me to get different variances across occasions. So it's two different pieces that have to be specified to get you to an unstructured matrix. And then I'm asking it to print the R core matrix as well. EM means is the analog of margins or LS means that gets you the means at each occasion as well as pairwise differences. And when I tried to get it using the correct satter weight degrees of freedom, it threw me an error, so then I had to switch. So this output is actually incorrect because it's using the wrong satter weight degrees of freedom. And I couldn't get it to work. So. Needless to say, I will not be asking in your homework for any model that does not behave itself across all the programs. Good times. All right, any questions on what we're doing, why, or how? No. Perfectly clear? Enough, anyway? Clear enough? All right. Just a quick question. The Please. red, what's in red, is that what you're actually including in the in the script? What's in red? Yeah, in like Stata above. Oh, yes. Um, in Stata, things that are in, qu in quotes turn red. And so that's just a title that I put okay. in the output to match. Um, oh, in the output, that comes out in the output. Okay. Yeah, so it, it prints it in the output as a title. Um, I think, I mean, it, say the echoes everything to the output, but this makes it sort of like stand, stand off, like um, in parallel with what SAS has here. Okay. So you could make this a comment, but I chose to make it a display. Hey, Lisa, I have a quick question. I you. was just wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about some examples for like how we might use this um like i was just thinking about measuring things across time in education and i i just i'm trying to wrap my head around like other examples as to how this would work or how this would apply yeah so 
I would do this anytime that I have a brand new data set that either I want to do longitudinal modeling or someone else wants me to do it for them. And I want to know what type of models are going to be most useful because there's 8,000 ways to indicate change and only some of them are going to work for any given data set. So the rationale for estimating this model is to figure out, okay, what does change look like on average? What do the variances look like over time? Are they the same over time? Are they changing over time? If they're changing over time, is it in a particular pattern? Because that's going to be informative as to what kind of random effect structure I'm going to want. So this is just giving me sort of the lay of the land with respect to the data. Um, it's not any different than what you would typically do when you're working with a new data set in terms of printing descriptive statistics. Just what are the means of the variables? What are the ranges? What are the possible values? I'm doing it in a model rather than doing it as descriptive statistics because of discrepancies in what would happen due to missing data. So if you have complete data, like I did in this example, then you could just ask for what the mean is at each occasion using proc means, or you could do a saturated model like I'm doing here, and it would work out to be exactly the same. If you have missing data, the means that show up descriptively are not going to match these means. The descriptive means, like if you just run proc means, those are based on an assumption of missing completely at random because it's just using whatever data are left at the later occasions to, to make a mean. But the people who don't come back to a study usually are not a random subsample of the people who started out. And so it's more accurate to try and estimate what the means would be for each occasion under an assumption of what's known as missing at random, which is conditionally random given their other data. And so what this model is trying to capture is just descriptive statistics that you would have gotten from the data had they been complete. That's what this is trying to give me. And the same thing is true with the covariance matrix. I can get a covariance matrix out of proc core descriptively, but it's going to be based on whatever data are there, not the data that could have been there, which is what the model is giving me. So that's, that's actually a great question because a lot of times when people are doing longitudinal research, they'll want to report a table of means and standard deviations. Those aren't going to match what the model's working with. So it's actually better to report descriptive means and standard deviations from these models because they're consistent with, with what's happening in terms of the likelihood estimation, trying to capture the description of the data that would have been for complete data rather than incomplete data. Okay, she says that helps. So yeah, I am trying to do proc means. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to get the lay of the land to figure out what the patterns are in here. What does each occasion look like? What kind of change do I have? Are people going up? Are they going down on average? Are they um, going down faster as time goes by or to the same extent? Just lay of the land with likelihood. So um, this is a good example, by the way, of why I don't spend any time really emphasizing things like sums of squares in my earlier classes is because even if you wanted to, you can't do this shit by hand. If you have incomplete data, the, the variances and covariances have to be found through iterative methods. And once you have those, then you can get the fixed effects. But it's not something that can be done by hand if you have incomplete data. It has to be through likelihood. So getting the software to be able to do it for you is going to be your only option. All right, a long answer to a short question. Um, so am I allowed to ask the or answer the question? Yes, it's it's to everybody. Okay, who is writing a paper that got rejected, trying to measure across time experiences, but using qualitative data. Um, yeah, I, so I can't comment at all about qualitative data analysis. I'm just going to tell you all that. that that's, that's, so I know nothing about it whatsoever. So I can't, I can't weigh in on that. Um, but what I can say is that descriptive information based on the available data does not match what the model is trying to do in recreating the results you would have had given complete data. That I can tell you. All right. 
Yep. My soda's empty. Do you know how I know that? Because I'm talking a lot and I'm talking fast. So let me uh, just take it down a notch. By the way, I got an email today that um, I could turn on closed captioning during this if anybody wanted to see the words. Is that something that would be of interest to you guys, you folks? I didn't know if it would be helpful or distracting, but we could try it and see how it goes. So I enabled it so that we could do that. Um, yep, there's my words. Okay, I'm going to have to not look at the text. This is going to be like a, a divided attention thing because I because the motion is going to kill me. So if I can, here, I'm going to put my phone in front of the bottom of the screen. So there we go. Got a low tech solution. All right. So now I don't, I'm not watching my words, but you can see my words as I ramble through this. Uh, by the way, YouTube, one of the reasons that I post on YouTube as opposed to recording the, the videos for Icon and such is that it does close captioning. So it takes a few days for it to kick in, but you can open the transcript that shows up on any of the videos and actually search for keywords like homework question or, you know, G matrix. So you can, you can search for those things and find the place in the video where I talk about it. So, all right, so we'll, we'll give that a try. If, uh, if you don't like it, you can put your phone in front of that section of the screen like I did. Other questions before we dive into what this looks like? All right. So if we have a SAS output on the handouts that I've annotated, however, um, full output from the other programs is available in the example files online. So if you wanna follow along with the R output, there's a text file that you can annotate and the same thing with Stata. I should mention that your next homework that is available right now, it's due a week from Thursday. Literally the point of it is to get you used to looking at output. It's most of the points are computational and it's like find the intercept variance, find the fixed intercept, find the minus two log likelihood. Like those are the questions because I want you to get used to searching through these things and knowing where the numbers are and what they mean. So to give you practice with that with different kinds of models, um, that is what the next homework is. So just negotiating this output, I recognize, is potentially a barrier because it gets more complicated because the model has a lot more complexity to it. So SAS is telling me that I have 10 covariance parameters. What that means in semi-English, I would say, is that I have 10 parameters in my model for the variance, and that is because what I asked it to give me is an unstructured model for four occasions just like in your quiz. See, it wasn't a coincidence that I set you up to think about what would happen for four occasions. Columns in X, that's the number of columns in my design matrix, the matrix of fixed effects. One of them is gonna have to get kicked out of the model for the solution to be found though, because four columns for wave are redundant with the intercept. So it's gonna break down into four fixed effects, not five, but SAS still counts the column that got kicked out. Columns in Z, Z is the matrix that holds the predictors that have random effects. Right now I don't have any random effects in the model, so that's why it's zero. And then subjects is the number of highest level units. So at this point, highest level is person. We have occasions nested in persons. I have 25 of those, and each person has up to four occasions. So all of the programs should spit out this kind of descriptive information related to how it's reading in the data. Check that first to make sure that it understands your nesting structure and that you agree with the number of people it thinks you have and the number of occasions. Okay, then right here, here's R and directly below it is our core. So as you got a chance to practice with your homework, R is variances and covariances. So if I asked you a question, you know, what is the variance at wave one? That's right here. The variance across persons at wave one. The variance across persons at wave two the variance across persons at wave three and wave four. So I have a picture that illustrates these, but if we just look at these and eyeball them, 
What do you think about these variances over time? Do they look the same over time or different? Not the same, right? They look pretty different to me. Like different random or different in a pattern? Yeah, the variance is increasing over time, different in a pattern. That's a dead giveaway for random slopes. If you see variance that increases over time or decreases sort of monotonically, meaning it doesn't change directions, people are spreading themselves out. So changing variance over time in one direction is a giveaway that you have individual differences and in change. The off diagonals in the R matrix are covariances. It is hard to interpret those numbers because they are both the extent that those occasions are correlated and the extent that those occasions have different variances. Covariance is both of those things. So for that reason, I can ask it to print R core instead, and these are correlations. So this is the equivalent of a Pearson correlation matrix for your variables. To what extent are scores at wave one as one column correlated with scores at wave two? They are correlated 0.82. Scores at wave one are correlated with scores at wave three, 0.51. So this pattern of correlation over time, let me add one more. Do those correlations look the same or do they look different? Yeah, I, I think they look like they're different. It looks like the ones that are closer together are more related, but not like uniformly so. So this pattern is not necessarily a dead giveaway for what the pattern should be, other than that compound symmetry is probably not going to work for these data. Now, why am I saying that? What does compound symmetry predict for a pattern? Yeah, same. This is some kind of not the same. I don't know what kind of not the same, but just not the same. Likewise, compound symmetry says these variances are the same, and they are not the same. Not the same increasing is what it looks like to me, but not the same is the key. So this is what I mean when I say this is the answer key. This is the pattern that our model in terms of the residuals and the random effects are trying to capture. That's their job is to come up with this and to do it in fewer than 10 parameters. So all I know right now is that compound symmetry is probably not going to work. And it's not. I'll just tell you that right now. Because I made the data up and I know what the right answer is. <laughs> but in life, you don't get to know that most of the time. All right. How are we doing? Okay, so this unstructured R-only model is my answer key for what kind of random effects and residuals and their covariances I'm going to need. This is the thing they are supposed to be recreating. The next table lists each individual parameter in the model for the variance. UN11, UN21. UN stands for unstructured. The numbers, the first number gives the row and the second number gives the column. So this is just a different way of giving the same information that was in that matrix. So like 1, 1, 2.36, that's row one, column one of my R matrix, which is right here. So that's the variance at wave one. So these matrices just make it easier to read the output and to know what the numbers mean, but they also, um, but then this output here also provides standard errors for these variances. And these p-values, by the way, you are not ever allowed to look at. Reviewer 3 is going to find out, and they're going to yell at you. There's like 18 people in the world who know about this difference and care, and just in case any of them is Reviewer 3, I want you to be prepared. We're not allowed to use this z as a test statistic and the p-value that goes with it because this Z and this test statistic is based on the idea of a normal sampling distribution for variances. So Z is testing that variance against a null hypothesis of zero.
but what's the smallest that a variance can be? Zero. So can you have a normal distribution around zero for what your variance can be? Uh-uh. So that Z doesn't work. And it works less well the closer you get to the null hypothesis you're testing against, which is undesirable. So anytime that you have a question about whether you need any of these parameters in the model for the variance, we do what instead? Like you practiced in your homework to test whether or not you needed heterogeneous topolits instead of homogeneous. Likelihood estimation. <laughs> Close. Likelihood something something. You want to phone a friend, Lane? Call on someone else? Likelihood ratio test, there it is. Yeah, so walled test, by the way, is the thing that you can't do. The walled test is your Z that comes from estimate divided by standard error. That's what you can't do for anything related to variances. You probably could do it for covariances, but that gets a little sketchy. The likelihood ratio test is the most proper way to test whether any of these things is different than zero. So we have to ask the program to give that information to us. The only likelihood ratio test that it gives us by default is whether we need anything beyond a residual. So according to this model, we have nine extra parameters relative to just saying there's a single residual that has constant variance and no covariance. So yeah, this test is not terribly informative, the one that it shows up by default. Here are the test uh, information criteria and minus two log likelihood values. So just to remind you, this number right here, neg two log like, that number is minus two log likelihood in which bigger is better or smaller is better. Cough, cough, homework question. Yeah, smaller is better for minus two log likelihood. Bigger is better for log likelihood. Do I have, let me see here. I didn't print it, but there's another p another table that shows up before that that gives this number to more decimal places that you can use for your homework. So you'll need to take it from that table. Um, for those of you who are using R or Stata, you get log likelihood instead. So then you'll have to multiply it by minus two yourself. I did figure out how to get R to, just, to spit it out, but Stata doesn't, as far as I know. Now we get to the other side of the model. So solution for fixed effects, this lists all of the parameters in the model for the means. So at this point, we have treated time as a categorical predictor. The predictor is actually wave, and wave four is the reference. So the interpretation of the intercept, as indicated by proc Lisa labeled over here, this is beta zero. That is the mean at wave four if the data were complete. So in this case, it is the mean at wave four because the data are complete, that if you had incomplete data, this would be the mean you should have gotten had you had complete data under an assumption of missing at random. So it's not going to match what you get out of the descriptive statistics if you have incomplete data. So the mean at time four, wave four, excuse me, is 15.55. Each of these is the difference of another wave relative to the reference wave four. So relative to the reference wave four, wave one is five less. Relative to the reference wave four, wave two is three less. Wave three is like two less also. And so to get to what it would be at each wave, you take 15, for instance, if you wanna know what wave one is predicted to be, add to it the minus five, and that gets you down to this output right here, which does the math for you. So I tried to label how these LS means are created by linear combinations of beta zero plus each of the coefficients to distinguish the other waves. So this is the pattern that we're going to be modeling at 
wave one, we have an average of about 10. It creeps up to 11 to 13 to 15. And then the joint test of whether these three contrasts are significant. The omnibus main effect of time in ANOVA language, that is given to us right here. So this F of 23.86 says, is there any change over time, period? And it's a three degree of freedom test for the four means. The answer is yes, it looks like it. But to know what pattern that change takes, we would need to look at the means themselves, which are down here. Okay, questions. Any of that you want repeated? Is it doing a good job transcribing me, by the way? Decent? Okay, well, that's helpful. If it helps, great. If not, hopefully it doesn't make it worse. And then here right, are the, the differences between each pair. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so with that p-value being significant, so that means... Sorry, what, what is it meaning again? <laughs> What's different? Uh, this p-value right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a joint hypothesis test of whether the three contrasts that distinguish the four means are significant. Okay. So you can think of this as an omnibus mean effective time in ANOVA language. You could also think of it as the a test of the change in R square from adding in this effective wave relative to an empty model. Okay, thanks. Sure. Question, are the estimates the fixed intercepts rather than slopes in this case with categorical ver? Uh, which estimates? I was thinking the fixed effects. Um, yep. These ones? Well, that, I mean, actually, the, it would have to be out of the least square means table. Mm -hmm. These are predicted intercepts. Oh, yes. Okay, so actually it was the first one. I'm thinking of like the B1 number that would go right before the like the wave one in the, in the model. So yes, yes, like the so, negative five. Yeah, so like negative five is what the model came up with for beta one, which is how far off wave one is from wave four. Terminology wise, do you call it? A f I know people just say fixed effect, but is it really like an intercept rather than a slope? No, it is a slope. Okay, but the, you're, we're talking about a categorical, like for the whole group, right? We are talking about taking wave and treating it as a categorical predictor, but we're letting SAS do the dummy coding that that implies for us. So under the mm -hmm. hood, what it's doing is creating four new dummy coded variables for one, if it's one, if it's that wave and zero, if not, it leaves off the last one, which makes the last one the reference. And so it's internally creating a, is this wave four or wave one? Is this wave four or wave two? And these are the slopes that multiply those internal contrasts. So is there a situation in which you would call it an intercept? Like when would that happen for a fixed, so fixed effect? This is a fixed intercept. Oh, just cause it's the, okay. All right, I gotcha. Um, you could take out the fixed intercept if you wanted and then the four columns would all be used and they would each be intercepts. That is another way of estimating the same hmm. model, except then this F test would get screwed up because it would be testing all four against zero rather than three against the mean of the four. Hmm. Okay, thanks, that makes sense. Okay, so yes, fixed effect is a more general term. Intercept and slope are specific kinds. Um, I tend to slip and say fixed effect when I really mean fixed slope. So I will try to work on that. Thank you for the question. Because yes, this is an intercept. These are slopes. Other questions? All right, then I made pictures. I think that's what's next. Yeah, I did. 
And I made pictures in Excel because there's nothing wrong with that. Do you know what's nice about making pictures in Excel? You can give your Excel file to your collaborators and they can mess with it. They don't have to learn R to make gra graphics or learn SAS. So that's why I make pictures in Excel when I can. So this picture is showing the individual data. So a separate line for each of my 25 people. Uh, this is what's known uh, informally as a spaghetti plot or a plot of individual trajectories otherwise. And then I just plotted the means by wave in red, since we're using red for our model for the means parameters, and the means, uh, the variances, excuse me. So the y-axis in the lower picture with the blue here is variance. So the red trend makes it look like the means are increasing over time, and they're doing so, I would say, relatively linearly. It looks mostly like a straight line. In contrast, we said that the uh, the variances were increasing over time, right? Does this look linear to you? The blue line? No, it looks kind of bendy, right? It looks like there's an acceleration of variance between three and four. So that is a reflection of the way that I generated the data. And I'll tell you that right now. The way I generated these data is including a fixed slope for time that is linear, as well as a random slope for time that is linear. And in chapter five, I go through the math behind it, but it works out that a random linear time slope predicts a pattern of variance that changes quadratically over time. So this is the direct result of that additional term being included. So that's the kind of un, unsame <laughs> that we have. They're not the same over time. All right. If you can't do an unstructured model, so like in your homework, for instance, I'm going to ask you not to do an unstructured model because I'm not able to estimate it with only 15 people, but you can still do an answer key model with respect to the mean side. So this is what I would do instead if the previous model was not estimable, either because I didn't have enough people or because I don't have balanced time. I would do the same saturated means model but change the variance structure to compound symmetry. So the goal of this analysis would be to get the lay of the land with respect to the means, ignoring the variance side for just the time being. So you would have to round time into convenient intervals in order to use this if you had unbalanced data, but it can still be useful. So the only difference is in changing the variance structure to have a random intercept in G and to have a residual only that has constant variance and no covariance in R. So that we're adding back in the random intercept. I'm asking it to print G, V, and V core, and I'm asking it to print R as well. And so then that is residuals independent after we have a random intercept in Stata. And in R, I can now use LME which allows uh, random effects and R matrix structures, or I can use Elmer. So these are two different ways of estimating the same model. That one, that's what it looks like in LME, and the same model in LMER. So the difference between them, LME allows other R matrix structures like autoregressive that LMER does not. LMER only allows uh, VCR matrices. It's supposed to be computationally more stable because there's fewer options to it with respect to the covariance structure. So they could build that into the programming in a more efficient way. So I'm using LME solely for the purpose of generating the predicted V, R, and G matrices to show you I'm using LMER because it uses the correct denominator degrees of freedom. LME does not, except in the case of compound symmetry here. So then here's the rest of it asking for the same F test and pairwise differences. So saturated means with the compound symmetry structure as a backup if unstructured doesn't work. That way you can still get the answer key with respect to the model for the means, the average pattern of change. 
And so we're basically ignoring this part of it because it assumes that we have compound symmetry, even though we probably don't, and just focusing on the model for the means. So the results are pretty much the same for the point estimates. The standard errors are different, but we're not paying attention to those. And there's the same predicted means that we got from the other model. So this is what I would do instead if unstructured is not possible. Okay. Questions or thoughts about that? So that's one set of models, sort of like the most complex that you could have to get the lay of the land. If we start building from the other side, keeping it simple and adding things step by step, then we get to empty means random intercept. So in terms of prediction, here's my figure. We're in this top left box right here. So starting with the simplest model that we would entertain and seeing whether or not we have a fixed effective time and then seeing whether or not we have a random effective time. So an empty means random intercept model predicts this pattern right here. No change over time, no individual differences in change over time. That'll be a starting point for testing whether adding things is going to help it. So here's the equation that goes with it now using the multi-level notation. So level one, YTI, so we have one column of outcomes per occasion per person. So T is the level one identifier, I is the level two identifier, is a function of an individual intercept beta zero. It's individual because it has an I subscript. That in turn becomes an outcome at level two, which is defined with a fixed intercept. That's my Y looking thing here. This is the Greek letter gamma, plus a random intercept, U zero, so those two together get you to your individual intercept, and then E is what's left at a given occasion. So if you write this level two, level one version of the model as one idea, you would say that Y is a function of the grand mean plus U zero for how far off the person mean is from the grand mean plus E for how far off you are at that occasion from your person mean. So to operationalize that, no predictors in the model, no predictors in the model line. So time is not in the model yet, it's empty. Likewise, no predictors here, and no predictors here. Hang on. Think, wait a minute, uh-oh, copy paste error. I paste it in the fixed linear time model rather than the empty model. So this one is actually one ahead of where we're supposed to be. Yeah, it's supposed to be right here. I'll have to fix that. My bad. It would be, if I fixed it on the fly, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> there. So I had time here and I didn't have. And likewise, I can take time out of that one, change the label, empty means, change that label, empty means, and then change all of the labels that go with saving the output to empty ri so that will go here here and here as well as here and then i added an r to that for the elmer version so empty ri r as that that and that. There. Ta-da! You get a live demonstration of what it's like to make these handouts. It's a series of copy and replace. There. I think I got it all fixed. It'll be correct in the, uh, the online materials because otherwise I wouldn't have gotten the right results.
So I'm including the LME just so that I can show you GR and V. I'm including LMER because this one is going to be the right version. And by the way, I found this function that spits out minus two log likelihood directly in R. So it does the math for you if you use that function. But only if you have check rel equals false. So empty means random intercept model is what we've got here using a G and R combined structure. So random intercept is going to go in G, residual variance is going to go in R, no covariance whatsoever in R after we control for what's in G. There. So questions on any of the code? All right, then let's see what we get. So here's R. Because we're using a G matrix, what kind of variance is on the diagonal in R? I'll give you three choices, total, between, or within. Got one vote for within. Several abstainers. Because I have a G matrix, what's left in R? Is it total between or within? Another vote for within. Yeah, this is within person variation over time. So this is at each occasion, the variance of the E's relative to the fixed intercept. So the mean that's predicted by the model is the same over time. It's a flat line that's being predicted. So this is the variance of the E's relative to each person's individual person mean. And the model says that the variance is the same over time with no covariance of the residuals. So the E's have nothing to do with each other according to this model. They are how far off each observation is from the person mean where it's a flat line being predicted. That's because the model says all of the reasons why the E's were correlated is right here. It's G. The variance of the person mean deviations as the random intercept. So those are the collection of U zeros, the variance of the U zeros across people at level two. So G is level two, R is level one, and you stick them back together again and you get V. And because of this simple structure, if you literally take this 2.88 and just stick it everywhere, you get the right answer. Once we have a random slope, it won't be quite that simple. But here's the compound symmetry V matrix that results, where the diagonal is the residual variance that's within persons in R, plus the random intercept variance that's between persons in G. That together gets me the total. The off diagonal, the covariance over time, that's all the same, that's compound symmetry. That comes from the random intercept variance only. And the correlation version of that is V core. So taking these variances and covariances and standardizing them to all have a variance of one gets you down here. And that number right there has a special name. That's my interclass correlation. So intraclass correlation is the intercept variance divided by the total variance. It's a proportion. How much of the variability is what? So 29% of the total variability in my outcome is what, according to this model? Give me as many words as you can think of. There's like 10 of them. 29% of the total variability across persons and occasions is due to between person. Yep, take that. Another one. What level? Two or one? Level two. There's another one. Cross-sectional or longitudinal? Cross-sectional due to people having different means or people varying over time.
Different means, yeah. Uh, due to inter-individual differences or intra-individual differences? Inter, yeah. 29% level two between random intercept G inter, cross-sectional. That means 71% uh, within intra-level one residual longitudinal. So the intra-class correlation is a descriptive statistic. It's not going to be accurate though if compound symmetry doesn't fit, but it is something that you would be expected to report for any variable that is measured repeatedly over time along with its mean and standard deviation and stuff like that, its intra-class correlation comes along for the ride. And just to recall, if you want to do a longitudinal analysis and be the first person in your field to report on longitudinal data, what value of ICC means game over? One. Game over if intra-class correlation equals one because then it's all between, it's all cross-sectional, they told you the same thing every time you ask them, and you don't actually have longitudinal data. Yes. In practice, uh, a lot of you may be asked to work with data that are unfamiliar to you once people find out that you know how to do multi-level modeling. And when you go into a data set that you're not familiar with, ICC is a very handy way to figure out whether or not the variable is a person thing or a time thing. If you have a predictor that is between persons, it should have an intraclass correlation of one. If you have a predictor that is within persons, such as time here, it should have an intraclass correlation of zero. Anything that is between the two is partly between person and partly within person. So we will have to worry about that with respect to predictors for the same reason we worry about it with respect to outcomes. Foreshadowing, da, da, da. Okay. So here are then the two parameters that the compound symmetry model for the variance has. So the purpose of showing all of these matrices up here is to show how they make a prediction. So I feel like it's helpful to see it, but under the hood, what's being estimated directly is the random intercept variance, which worked out to be 2.88, and the residual variance at level one, which worked out to be seven. Those two numbers give you everything else that's in those matrices on the previous page. This is the one instance in which the null model likelihood ratio test that shows up by default on your output, it also shows up in state output by default, by the way, it's testing whether or not you need a random intercept. So it's asking relative to a model that is E only, a single level model, how much better does this model fit? So the chi-square of 9.79 is a test statistic for the significance of the random intercept. So another way to look at this is this test statistic right here for whether or not the random intercept variance that covers between person differences is greater than zero corresponds to the intraclass correlation as its effect size. So intraclass correlation is an effect size for how much of the longitudinal variance is actually cross-sectional between persons and their means, and the significance test that goes with whether or not that intraclass correlation is greater than zero is the test of whether or not the random intercept variance is greater than zero. So those two ideas go together. That's not something you would typically report in longitudinal data. It's sort of taken as a given that you need a multi-level model, but in some contexts, this would be noteworthy. So for instance, in cluster data, if somebody comes to you and says, I have these cluster data, but do I have to control for school? Your answer is, well, I don't know, do you? Look at your test. Do you have an intraclass correlation that's not zero? Okay, then you have to control for school. So, and then last but not least, here is the fixed effect in the empty model of fixed intercept. So this model says that the mean across time is 12, 
12 is predicted to hold for all four waves. We know that's wrong, but this is a jumping off point for judging whether or not adding fixed and random effects related to time is going to make the model better. All right, questions. I know it's a lot. That's why you have a homework just on finding numbers. Your, own, your homework is like, I think, four different models and find the numbers that go with them because this is a learning process. So based on this, you'd be able to do about the first half of it, and then we'll finish this up on Thursday so that you can do the rest of it. All right, anything else before we call it a day? All right, if you're feeling overwhelmed, just hang in there. It gets better. This is overwhelming. It is. And it took me years and years and years before this shit just rolls off my tongue and I still mess it up sometimes. So don't feel bad if it's not crystal clear yet. We will keep going over and over and over it and each time a little more will sink in, a little more will sink in and it will get to the point where it feels not quite as terrible. That's our goal for the end of the semester. Not quite as terrible. All right, then office hours start now. Let me know if you need anything. I'll see you Thursday otherwise. Go out and enjoy the sunshine.